Hello and welcome. Who has the upper hand, China or the USA? That's one of the dynamics being closely watched as the Chinese President Hu Jintao prepares to meet with his U.S. counterpart Barack Obama in Washington, D.C. on Wednesday. What challenges do they face in trying to reset a testy and often confrontational relationship between the two nations? The tides have soured over a number of issues in the past few years, with the U.S. blaming China for keeping the value of its currency artificially low to boost exports. The White House has also accused Beijing of censoring the Internet, cracking down on political dissidents, and escalating territorial disputes with its neighbors. For its part, China blames the U.S. dollar for the global economic downturn and has called for a new world currency system. It has also defended its tight control over political freedoms to protect what it calls the evolving socialist democracy. So today we ask, how should the United States handle its relationship with an increasingly assertive China? Remember, you can call in with your questions and comments. You can also send us an email or a text message to the show. Joining me now from Los Angeles is Nina Hachigian, senior fellow at the U.S. think tank Center for American Progress and co-author of the book, The Next American Century, How the U.S. Can Thrive as Other Powers Rise. And in New York, we have commentator and columnist Gordon Chung, who has written The Coming Collapse of China, giving his perspective on the future of the Asian giant. Here in the studio with me is Cheng Li, a native of Shanghai and a specialist in U.S.-China relations at the Washington, D.C.-based Brookings Institution. I welcome you all to the show. Thank you. Uh, and Nina Hachigian, if I could start with you and ask you, uh, what right does the U.S. have at this stage uh, to pressure the Chinese uh, government on currency, considering how the dollar has declined? And, and I guess even uh, many of America's Middle, Middle Eastern allies, such as the UAE and Kuwait, are all starting to look away from the U.S. currency and, you know, considering uh, pegging to others or a basket of other currencies. Well, we certainly have our own work to do in terms of um, uh, making sure that our long-term fiscal position is, is sustainable and taking care of our national debt. But the fact is that most economists agree that the Chinese uh, currency is, is just undervalued. Um, inflation is, is in China has been taking care of that a little bit lately. And so, you know, on an annualized basis, it's, it's, ri it's been rising at about a rate of 10 percent, which, which uh, does, does help uh, the U.S. side and, and others who are affected by, uh, by that low currency rate. Now, one thing the Chinese government, well, say the Chinese government has said it would cool down the economy uh, to try to stop it overheating. How much sign has there been of at least some action on the part of China? Yeah, no, there has there has been some. They've been adjusting their interest rates um, and taking a number of other measures to make the uh, renminbi more convertible on international markets. So they they have taken some steps, but um, from a U.S. perspective. Uh, Never, never quite enough, never soon enough. All right. Well, Gordon Chang, I want to welcome you in with uh, the issue of, the, of the, you know, China not letting the uh, yuan appreciate uh, is perhaps, you know, the biggest sticking point in the relationship had, it has with the U.S. Uh, at the moment. Now, here's what the U.S. Treasury Secretary, uh, Timothy Geithner, had to say on the issue recently. Now, we believe it's in China's interest to allow the currency to appreciate more rapidly in response to market forces, and we believe China will do so because the alternative would be too costly both for China and for China's relations with the rest of the world. Now, of course, tough words from uh, Geithner, but Beijing isn't backing down. Days before his visit to the U.S., uh, China's President Hu Jintao made it clear that his government has strong views about the U.S. dollar and its role in the global currency system. Now, he said, the, currency, uh, the current international currency system is the product of the past. The monetary policy of the United States is a major impact, has a major impact on global liquidity and capital flows, and therefore the liquidity of the U.S. dollar should be kept at a reasonable and stable level. Um, I want to get your perspective, Gordon Chang, on how, how valid the, uh, the, the counter-argument is there from, from China. Well, you know, the U.S. dollar is a product of the past, but that doesn't really speak to what its future is, and it's probably going to be the currency of the future as well. The renminbi, after all, is non-convertible. The Chinese economy is going through some very difficult phases with inflation, property bubbles, all of the aftermath of the incredible stimulus program last year and the year before. So essentially, uh, China has a lot of problems before it even thinks about becoming the world's reserve currency. And the other thing, of course, is that the Chinese love to meddle. And you can't have a country that has the world's reserve currency meddling to the extent that the Chinese do. But I wonder what, what right does the U.S. have, China, for example, to, to ask uh, China to open up its uh, markets to foreign corporations when the U.S. itself is, is known for its uh, protectionist policies, such as the subsidies for corn farmers? Well, you know, the, there's really very little comparison between the openness of the American economy and the Chinese economy, which is really quite closed in many respects. 
And, you know, we have every right to act in our self-interest, just as the Chinese have the right to act in their self-interest. So I don't see what the problem is with the United States talking about this. And it's not just the United States. You have countries around the world complaining about China right now as it's closing up its economy, as it's renationalizing industries, and as it engages in this predatory currency policies. Well, let me bring in uh, Chang Li here and, uh, and ask you, uh, ultimately, how strong is Washington's position uh, you know, against China when it comes to it? Because uh, Beijing is the, is the biggest foreign uh, holder of uh, U.S. debt, and, and I, I guess that gives China a very powerful position. Ultimately. Absolutely, because China knows that uh, its uh, economic importance is uh, getting uh, more and more important, and uh, so they have the leverage to bargain, and uh, they also believe that the United States needs China particularly on the economic front, but also in the areas of North Korea, Iran, and the nuclear non-proliferation, and uh, the, the climate change. So therefore, China, you do see the rise of confidence. Sometimes you can say overconfidence. But let me also mention that uh, China's uh, currency has uh, appreciated you know, about uh, 15 to 20 percent over the past uh, four or five years. And China is willing to continue to appreciate, but not as uh, fast uh, you know, like another 20 percent in a short period of time, because China believes that this will cause tremendous unemployment. 30 million people, 20 million people will lose their job. This will be very, very bad for China. Let me ask you, though, uh, uh, to what extent uh, or in what way could China use that leverage of nine hundred uh, billion dollars of U.S. Uh, debt, if, if it wanted to, how could it uh, use it? Well, again, the, the China, of course, China will not just uh, 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 sell its uh, its uh, uh, U.S. bonds because it's like the economic nuclear weapon. Mm. Uh, because the revenge is overwhelming, it's also not China's best interest. This also tells us that the U.S.-China economic relations is really should be win-win, where we both can benefit from cooperation, which could benefit from each other's success. So it's not just a win lose this kind of a situation. Mm -hmm. Let me bring in uh, Nina Hachigian again here and ask you to, to respond to an email question. We had this from a, a viewer in Somalia. I'll read this to you. Uh, it's from Abdi Waham uh, Hossam, uh, who says, the U.S. economy is nearly three times the size of China's. Where are all the fears coming from? It's an interesting point. How would you respond? That's a, that's a great question, actually. I think that um, right now Americans are tending to see China through the prism of our own economic hard times. And so though we are the biggest economy in the world by a long shot, a recent poll suggested that 50 percent of Americans think that China's economy is larger than ours. And I think that's just coming from where we are right now as a country with 10 percent unemployment and a large national debt and great, greater and greater fiscal austerity on the parts of local governments and states. and, and uh, and the federal government as well. So we're, we're hurting right now as a nation, and I think that, that magnifies our concerns about China. Even though, as Cheng Li pointed out, this is not a causal relationship. China is not rising because we are, uh, because we are experiencing hard times. And in fact, a lot of our relationship is, uh, is positive sum, is win-win. Well, Gordon Chang, an email for you, if I may, sir, from Zahir Ahmed, who wrote in saying, with the U.S. in decline, China will probably rise. With its history of great civilization, however, one would expect China to, walk to, uh, to work towards humanity's benefit rather than focus on its own uh, narrow interest. Now, do you see China, I mean, overtaking the U.S. in any sort of economic terms in, in the near future? Clearly not. You know, I have to disagree with Chung Li because the Chinese economy is becoming much more dependent on the U.S. Um, they've got an economy which is geared to selling things to us. You know, last year, 145 percent of China's overall trade surplus related to sales to the United States. That's an incredible number, and we don't use that leverage. So I, I actually don't think that the United States is in decline. I think China's got some really serious problems that it's been hiding. And as Nina is talking about, you know, Americans may perceive that we're in trouble, but we don't really perceive the troubles that other nations, especially China, are in right now. So I don't buy into the premise of that email question at all. Okay, well, uh, Zhang Li, a chance to respond here, and also an email question to you that well, touches on this. China is uh, the second largest uh, market in the world and will surpass the United States in about 10 years. We do see the rapid rise of China in economic term. This is uh, not only just experts, you know, will miss, will not miss it. But actually, American public, you see, the huge number of people percentage believe that's the case. China has advantage its market. China has advantage its infrastructure development. China also has advantage in terms of human resources are uh, catching up very quickly. And I think we should face these kind of challenges, and uh, we should learn some of the lessons from the the 2008 the financial crisis. 
just to consider that we're still the number one, and the, the question is that the, our strength relative decline. That's a fact. Well, Chang Li, an email question to you then from Sharjah in the UAE, where uh, Chris Thomas wrote in saying, the rise of China is a myth. China's people are poor, and its ostensible advancements in military technology are the product of reverse engineering. Well, certainly there's uh, some concern about uh, China's military modernization and particular use of uh, technology for military use. And, uh, but on the other hand, uh, we should put in perspective China's military expenditure is still one third of the U.S. In many areas, China is still like far behind. And, and also, it's not the China's interest to have a war at this point, which jeopardize China's economic uh, uh, development. So I think uh, the mill to mill military to military contact as uh, Secretary Gates just visited China, I think it's important. Mm -hmm. the, the most important challenge, I think, is on a strategic level, whether e uh, each country should treat other as an enemy. I think the Hu Jintao's visit could, ch could uh, can modify and could uh, improve the, the relationship. I think uh, U.S. and China relations can and should and must be on the right track okay. and to, uh, to a constructive uh, 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 relationship rather than just hostile relationship, which jeopardize you know, all the parties involved. Well, let's get a caller in from D.C. Uh, Farah is on the line. Go ahead, please. My question to your panel is that uh, China never dictates uh, uh, um, upon uh, U.S. policy that is made in the uh, United States. Why is U.S dictating uh, China's policy. Okay, uh, Nancy Hachikian, uh, uh, far as asking, you know, the, the, the China has never been a pawn to the U.S., so why, is, why, is, why should it uh, uh, acquiesce? Um, well, I think that, you know, China has moved to now becoming a systemically important player in a number of areas, and that's why I think it's completely legitimate for the United States to, along with others, uh, ask it to change its behavior. So one of those issues is, is currency and global imbalances and moving to a more domestic-led consumption model. Another is climate. So China may think that these decisions are only its domestic, uh, of its domestic concern, but they actually affect the whole planet. And so that is why I think it's it's you mm -hmm. know it's fair for the United States, uh, along with others, again, to to ask China to to change its policies. But I think Cheng Li is making an important point, which is that it's it's a complicated relationship, and it's it's ne it's not black and white, and it, it's one of we're deeply interdependent rivals. We are rivals that need each other, which mm -hmm. is which is awkward. But the the bottom line is that on a, on several issues, it's it's really important for us to cooperate in order to benefit. Chinese people, the American people, and right. people around the world. Well, let me ask you one thing, though. You know, that traditionally Washington has always, you know, pushed, especially when there are meetings, and we're looking forward, uh, looking ahead to the meeting that Hu Jintao is going to have with Barack Obama. But China's always faced the criticism from the U.S. about its human rights record, and I wonder, uh, you know, what what position uh, the U.S. is in, especially now. Uh, Barack Obama's pledge to close down Guantanamo Bay uh, was, certainly hasn't been met, and, and you know here we have Hu Jintao uh, arriving. Is that likely to? You know, is the human rights issue likely to be raised? Because there's a lot of uh, counter ammunition that Hu Jintao could have. I think it will absolutely be raised. I think it's it's you know it's it's a, it's just as Barack Obama said, it's who we are. These the values that we hold in democracy and individual rights are just part of our part of our fabric, and so they will it'll cert they will certainly be raised. Um, and the issue with Guantanamo Bay, it's not that the intent isn't there. The intent is there to shut it down. It's just really logistically, uh, legally, and politically complicated. But I would point you also to you know, Barack Obama's very early on pledge to renounce torture. And so what, what he's trying to do is, is change America as a role model for human rights. And I think that's one of the ways we can be effective in trying to ultimately uh, improve the human rights conditions in China is by being a good role model ourselves. Gordon Chang, if I could get an email to you that came in from Abdul Qadir Mahmoud Turajo, who wrote in, uh, both leaders must make sacrifices for the survival of their countries. The U.S. needs China, and China needs the U.S. And this echoes what uh, Chang Li has been saying about the need for mutual cooperation, not mutual destruction. And what's your view on that? Well, you know, certainly the United States needs China just as it needs other nations around the world. There's no, there's no question about it. Um, but, you know, to a certain extent, um, we have to view the world the way it is and not the way that we would like it to be. And, you know, there are certain things that the United States does need from China. We need China to stop proliferating nuclear weapons technology to Iran. We need China to stop backing North Korea's horrific campaign against South Korea, which we saw last year. 
and you know climate change you know there's a whole range of issues and so yes we need china but we have to see china really the way that it is and the one thing that we absolutely need to do is to tell the chinese in public that their flag officers should stop talking about waging war on the united states which is what they started to do last february we haven't had those honest conversations with the chinese and we need to have them well, let's, let's uh, look at uh, what uh, happened last week when U.S. Defense Secretary Robert Gates was in uh, Beijing. The Chinese military tested a new stealth fighter. A Pentagon official said that President Hu appeared unaware of that test, raising the possibility of a rift between China's armed forces and its civilian leadership. Now, uh, Robert Gates was asked uh, about it, and this is what he had to say. Well, I don't think I talked about a rift as much as I did the, fact, sim the simple fact, as, as was communicated, that... Uh, the civilian leadership uh, seemed uh, surprised by the test and assured me that it had nothing to do uh, with my visit. Well, Chang Li, I want to get your perspective on this. I mean, uh, it seemed like Hu Jintao was unaware, uh, and uh, even uh, Robert Gates said that you know, he really seemed to believe that was the case. Well, what sort of a rift does that indicate within the Chinese system? Well, there are two interpretations. One is that uh, Hu Jintao knew, but uh, he pretended he did not know that he uh, can blame the military. Secondly, he may not know that exactly what happened a few days before, or certainly he believes that it was not del deliberately you know, used for that occasion. So, but uh, I think that uh, certainly we see the rise of military leadership, particularly they sometimes hijack the public opinion, represents this nationalist sentiment. This is a disturbing trend we should monitor very, very closely. But on the other hand, I think it's still civilian leadership, Hu Jintao is in control, in charge. There's no question about that. There's no military strongman. There's, a milita there's no kingmaker in the military. Now, Gordon Chung, there was a time when uh, uh, Ronald Reagan, the former U.S. president, used to refer to the Soviet Union as the evil empire. Now, no one's saying that uh, on this side of the, uh, the Atlantic uh, with, in the case of China, but I wonder if things are moving in, the, in that direction. It could end up being that kind of face-off, especially with a kind of military face-off that, that we saw during the Cold War. Well, what we saw last year was a very interesting dynamic in Southeast Asia because of China's claims to the entire South China Sea extending as far down as to Indonesia. We saw the region turn to the United States looking for leadership. This is not a case where the United States is trying to put a, together a coalition against China. On the contrary, the United States, especially since the Bush administration, has been running away from a leadership role in Asia. And what we saw are the Vietnams, the Indonesias, sort of going to the United States and saying, you've got to do something about what is a hostile and belligerent China. Now, I, I think that what we need to do is have some very honest conversations with the Chinese about free navigation over international water and airspace. And, and essentially, there is going to be a new dynamic in Asia as countries look to Washington for help. Nina uh, Hachigian, is, is there really such a bad thing having uh, another superpower on the global stage, having something to counterbalance the U.S.'s, uh, you know, two decades of domination, I guess? Well, whether it's a good or a bad thing, it's it's the reality that China is a growing uh, power and and is probably in, in many areas at this point already could be considered a great power. And I think you know I think that there is an opportunity for for the U.S. and, Ch and China to cooperate on issues that we both care about. What we hear a lot in the U.S. media is about is the headline China clashes with the United States. And it's and as Gordon has pointed out, it's been accurate over the last year and on a whole slew of in a whole slew of incidents and a number of different areas. But at the same time, we are also cooperating. We are cooperating with China on tough sanctions against Iran. We are in in very recent weeks, uh, China has played a constructive role in telling North Korea to ratchet back its its provocative. Uh, behavior. We had a good result uh, in Cancun uh, because China has now agreed to have its emissions internationally verifiable. So, you know, these are incremental steps, but it is pointing to how it could be if the U.S. and China were to be able to uh, get past some of their great distrust, which is, you know, founded, um, but still find ways to cooperate. We've got a caller on the line from New York. Hassan, what would you like to ask? Well, my question is, if there is a possible leader, uh, rift between the Chinese civilian and military leadership, how predictable and rational will Chinese actions be in the future? Well, let me ask uh, Chang Li to answer that, that if there is a rift, how, how rational would the, how predictable could it be? Well, uh, China will have a leadership succession in two years. And uh, there's also widespread view that uh, some of the military leaders may challenge the civilian leadership, but particularly that China's military leaders become increasingly technocratic 
while the civilian leadership has become increasingly less technocratic. So there must be tension. But on the other hand, I think what Deng Xiaoping created that the military should only uh, uh, take care of their business, basically national defense, not involve domestic politics, not involve China's foreign policy. So that's a principle. So far, there's no strong uh, 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 challenge from the military on that. Let me ask you though, to answer an email question we got from a viewer by the name of Sikandar Azad, mm -hmm. who wrote in saying, American military power in the Pacific region is waning as China pushes into new regions. The U.S. will not have the same weight it had 10 years ago. And, and listening to what Gordon Chang had to say earlier about China's involvement with uh, North Korea and also its, you know, its, its, its supplying Iran well, and so on. Certainly China did not do well in terms of foreign policy. I think they made mistakes. They alienated China's neighboring countries. But we should put into perspective, we are deeply concerned about the, the, the another kind of Cold War in the Asia uh, Pacific. So this is things that what uh, Henry Kissinger, Dr. Henry Kissinger said we should avoid. We should avoid these countries take position either with the United States or with China. This is uh, not a, uh, we should not use this kind of 19th century mentality or Cold War mentality to see an uh, ever-changing world. China and should, uh, United States should work together even in sensitive issues like North Korea, Iran, and, uh, and uh, other areas. But uh, certainly, again, we should raise our concern, but we still hope that China will be a stakeholder to play a positive role. It's also China's best in all right. Well, Nina Hachigi, and we've got, of course, the, the two presidents meeting in a day's time. And I wonder to what degree there is a chance to, to press that reset button, which uh, everyone is talking about. Uh, I think that I think so. I mean, I think that they'll be able to change. I'm not sure reset is, is exactly the right word because it's just in the nature of the relationship to have issues on which, you know, we, we clash and issues on which we see eye to eye. Um, I do think that at least for a time uh, that the, that the summit could help to propel uh, cooperation between the two sides um, and to at least change the narrative somewhat in the United States and show that there is the side of, of the U.S.-China relationship um, that is mutually beneficial and that, and that is cooperative. And it, it's an important time to do this because, as Cheng Li mentioned, we're going into a leadership transition both in China and in the United States, and there is political pressure on both sides to be uh, somewhat uh, tough on each other. So in the United States, there's a test, you know, your lit political litmus test that you're tough on China. And in China, you can never be seen to be backing down in the face of foreign pressure. So mm -hmm. now is a time to try to get the relationship right and to try to uh, max maximize the, the benefits of it. And of course, both sides. And of course, Gordon Chang, I guess there's some pressure also coming from the sort of gra grassroots level. There have been more uh, so-called mass incidents and labor strikes and taking place in China, putting more pressure on the leadership. Um, and I wonder, especially seeing what's been going on elsewhere in the world, Tunisia and, and the fear that kind of people power might rise, how much China watches that kind of uh, situation closely and worries that it really has the, the will of the people to contend with uh, more than it, than it might have in the past? Well, Chung Lee would know better than me, but I'm sure that in Beijing right now, they're very concerned about Tunisia. Um, there was a headline in People's Daily which said, uh, President left, nation erupts. <laughs> and, and that probably wasn't a coincidence. But we have seen something like 200,000 protests a year in, in recent years in China. We've seen a volatility in society. And it's really a change, I think. As China grows more prosperous, the people grow more restive. We've seen this pattern in South Korea, in Taiwan. Goes all the way back to the French Revolution, as Tocqueville noted. I think Chinese leaders are going to be very concerned about the, really the way society is going. All right, uh, Cheng Li, just a final thought, 30 seconds to go, uh, how you see the people power aspect of uh, China. Well, you do see the widespread resentment about the corruption, about the economic disparity, and all sorts of problems, including the property bubble, and it's become so expensive. But on the other hand, I think the Chinese government is still in the, in, in the mood of obsessing with stability. I think you do see the, the some other forces provide stability, like middle class, like NGOs and the legal right. professions. They will contribute a more stable China, more confident China. But at the moment, the Chinese leadership is very, very concerned about uh, all these possible uprising. Well, I want to thank you all for taking part and contributing. Of course, uh, we'll be keeping an eye on what's going on with the, the visit there as well. But thank, all, thank you all for your part in the debate. Pleasure. And thank you for being with us too. Now remember, you can follow the show on Facebook and see what we're up to there. You can give us your feedback on the topics and post your questions and comments. On the next show, the failure to meet promises. Guantanamo Bay remains open a year after Barack Obama vowed to shut it down. What's stopping the U.S. president from fulfilling his pledge? Be sure to tune in for that. From me and the team, we'll see you next time.